What's going on guys, this is Rob, and I know how much you all love crazy displays of power in Marvel Comics, godly beings fighting godly beings, and this video is gonna have it. You're gonna see a just ridiculous displays of power over the course of, of this comic. So let's just get into it, right? So what this does is it initially opens up with Dr. Doom attacking the Molecule Man, Owen Reese. For those people who are unfamiliar with the Molecule Man and unfamiliar with the power this guy has, this guy could snap his fingers and Earth would just cease to exist or the universe would cease to exist. This guy's level of power is so extreme that in Secret Wars 2, which was the follow-up to the original Secret Wars in 1984, this guy and the Beyonder fought to a standstill and their impact, right? The impact of their punches and their hits were so intense, they sent shockwaves throughout the multiverse, right? Now we'll, we'll kind of clarify the role of the Beyonder and all that kind of stuff over the course of this comic, because what we're gonna be doing here and really the reason why we're doing this in the first place is that we know that the Beyonder is in some capacity supposed to be involved in, in Avengers King Dynasty and Secret Wars. We don't really know what his role will be. The rumor is that he's gonna be a variant of Kang. I don't know, it's all just conjecture no one knows anything for sure but because it all might be true <laughs> we already covered secret wars in 1984 we covered secret wars 2 in 1986 and 1987 this is the unofficial secret wars 3 that took place that kind of wrapped up the plot threads from secret wars 1 and 2 and then of course we already covered jonathan hickman's avengers and new avengers along with secret wars in 2015 and then we did defenders beyond we've covered a lot of stuff that dealt with the beyonders and so we're going to compile all of this, along with a few things that we haven't done yet, we're gonna put all that into a singular great big huge video and send that out there for you guys to watch so you can become experts on the Beyonders for in however long it takes for you to finish that video. So the thing about this is with Dr. Doom having overpowered the Molecule Man, the only reason he's able to do this is because his attack comes fast and swift. That if the Molecule Man's not prepared for it, he's just like anybody else, right? Like he can be overcome by someone like Dr. Doom. Now, the other reason why Dr. Doom's able to do this is because the plot demands it. Let's be honest with ourselves, guys. Even if the Molecule Man was taken by surprise by Dr. Doom, the level of power this guy has, it wouldn't matter, right? So this is just kind of Steve Englehart just kind of being like, I mean, you know, reasons, just go along with it, comic book logic. But this whole story is actually going to change the power of Molecule Man and the Beyonder in a way that honestly people weren't the biggest fans of. But once this guy's defeated, of course, we get the classic Doctor Doom monologue where he says like, look at the street rabble flinch, though they know nothing of what I've done. Exiled from my homeland. He was actually defeated by his son, Christoph Renard and kicked out of his own country, which is kind of crazy, right? Stripped of the diplomatic immunity, which once shielded me. Am I not still Doom? Woe to the common policeman who attempts to subject me to American law. Woe to America. <laughs> It's one of the things I love about Dr. Doom. Dr. Doom, man, I love him because of just like his one-liners and stuff. The guy is just as much one of the deadliest forces in the universe as he is a just limitless repository of humor. I love Dr. Doom. <laughs> I love Dr. Doom. But here's the other thing too, right? So what you guys obviously see here as we're going through this is you see this chick that looks like the thing, right? Like she's just kind of big. She doesn't really have all the Rocky stuff. That's Sharon Ventura. She sucks. She hasn't been relevant in Marvel Comics in like 40 years. She's She hasn't mattered in forever. And even when this was going on, she still didn't matter. But the thing about this is that Sharon Ventura was just the attempt by Marvel to give like Ben Grimm his own love interest that was comparable to him. Because up until this point, he was basically married to a blind girl, or at least was dating a blind girl named Alicia Masters. And so it's just, it's one of those things that kind of goes on. But Doctor Doom, of course, invades Four Freedoms Plaza, right? The home of the Fantastic Four at this point in time. The whole reason why he does this is to gain access to a portal that they have in order to reach the realm or the, the dimension of the Beyonder, or at least the Beyonders themselves. Now, the whole reason why this is going on and the whole reason why Doom's doing this and even has any information about this in the first place is because in Fantastic Four issues 316 and 317 leading into this comic and the next one, three, uh, 318 and 319, is that the Fantastic Four, which Reed and Susan are kind of off doing their own thing, that's why you don't see them here, but the Fantastic Four had learned about an alien race called the Nawali. And while we as, as the reader didn't really get a whole lot of information about them, all we knew is they operated as agents of 
the Beyonders. And this is the first time when you actually hear the Beyonders referred to as a group, as opposed to a singular entity. But of course, Doctor Doom trying to get to that location, right, trying to get to the realm of the Beyonders, will consolidate and make, make sense of all that stuff by the time we finish this video. The Fantastic Four, of course, try to stop it, right? Now, of course, they're basically defeated by Doctor Doom, who just takes off into the portal himself. The Fantastic Four board a vessel, and they follow after him. But they're also doing that because at the same time, they want to know what's going on with the Beyonders and the New Wally. If for no other reason than to gain enough information to prepare for the potential return of the Beyonder. Because the last time that guy was on Earth, he wiped out pretty much all the cosmic entities and he almost destroyed everything in creation. There was actually a point where he killed Mistress Death, so nobody in the universe could die. And, and I wouldn't say he killed her, I would say he just snapped his fingers and she just ceased to exist. That's how powerful that guy was. Of course, he ended up bringing her back and everything was kind of set to rights and the fight between himself and the Molecule Man. But the bigger point that I'm making here is that as they make their way through what is in effect the multiverse, the first stop is the negative zone. Now the negative zone is not overly important to this particular story here. They pass through it. I mean, they fight Blastar, who's one of the guys who's in the negative zone. He doesn't really matter. Like he literally shows up, he attacks them. It almost destroys their vessel, right? Dr. Doom saves them. And that's kind of the way in which Steve Englehart explains how Dr. Doom ends up joining the Fantastic Four temporarily on their journey to figure out what's going on with the Beyonders. And so following this, things get really, really cool because what they start doing after passing through the negative Negative zone is they actually start passing through all these different universes that exist out there. The first universe they come across is a universe where everything is completely dark. There's no light there whatsoever. Now, you could make an argument, and I imagine this is something that Marvel, Marvel will probably end up doing later on down the line. This is where Null, the symbiote god, resides, or at least, you know, a place where he just kind of hangs out. The reason why I say that is that in Marvel Comics, Null was a being that existed really when, really before the current universe came into existence, when the celestial showed up and started creating life, it pissed him off, right? Bringing light to a, to a dark place. And so the results of this is that he waged war against the celestials. He was kind of banished to a degree. So Donnie Cates and them, I imagine, probably borrowed from this. The next universe they cross through is a universe completely and totally housed by the mad celestials. You could make a credible argument that during Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run, this was the universe where the Celestials came from, the Mad Celestials, who basically tried to destroy everything in existence, right? Who conquered their own universe and then tried to spread outward into other universes. So again, this is why I say it looks like Jonathan Hickman borrowed a lot of stuff from this particular story. But of course, as they, they continue to make their way through the multiverse, they end up coming to what looks like back home right like literally a place where there's clouds and there's a sun and there's buildings and stuff like that and in fact johnny storm gets pissed he was like dude you just brought us right back where we started we went on this whole mission for no reason and you were the one that said you could guide us to where we needed to be and the response of dr doom is no we're in the right place and he calls the beyonder out and it turns out not only is the beyonder basically the sun he's like you're all dead like i'm gonna kill you all <laughs> and he just immediately starts attacking everybody now what's kind of funny about this is that this was being written and done in a way in order to make the story credible or at least to give the story some some measure of longevity because they're literally in a universe that is the beyonder right like everything in this universe is the beyonder right the land the the sky and the sun the whole nine yards he is in effect god so if he wanted to, he could snap his fingers and they would simply just cease to exist. But in order to tell a compelling story and to kind of get to why all of this is happening in the first place, you basically see the Beyonder fighting against the Fantastic Four in a conventional form. Now the thing about this is that Doctor Doom approaches the Beyonder and instead of doing what he intended to do, or at least what he did do in the original Secret Wars from 1984, which was attack the Beyonder and then seize his power for himself, that what Doctor Doom actually wants is to be made whole. The reason for this is is because at a previous point in time in the Fantastic Four comics, that Doctor Doom had actually been killed, or at least was believed to have been killed, by Terax the Tamer, who was basically the main enemy of Galactus, or I'm sorry, the uh, one-time herald of Galactus. But the idea here is that in his defeat and with his body destroyed, he sent his consciousness into the mind of a normal human being who was watching the event unfold. Following that, he basically held his family hostage until he could find a way to bring himself back. And while he 
did do that momentarily, right? Which is to say, gathering the, the various armors that he needed and so on and so forth, he's not actually Dr. Doom at this point in time, meaning he's not his full self. Not only that, there are huge chunks of his memory that are missing. And so what he wants to be honored to do is to basically use his power to make Dr. Doom whole so that Dr. Doom can be back to his normal level of power. He can have all of his memories intact and he can in turn face off against his son, Christoph Renard, and basically seize control of Latveria again. The truth about why Dr. Doom is doing this is because if he's made whole, what he would be able to do is actually seize the, the, the Beyonder's power and then maintain that level of power and essentially become ruler of the universe. Dr. Doom doing Dr. Doom things, but as this happens and when the Beyonder is about to grant this request, we end up getting the arrival of two of the most powerful beings in the history of Marvel Comics, Cubic and the Shaper of Worlds. Now this is, this. Is, I know it seems like you guys are probably like, who? Like what, like, like, what is it, Guardians of the Galaxy? I'm Star-Lord, who? Like that kind of thing, right? <laughs> right, I'm gonna make all this make sense, don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. But the fight between these guys is immense, right? Like as soon as this happens, Cubic and the Shaper of Worlds immediately step in and they basically start to attack the Beyonder. Now what's crazy about this, and this is where we start to get into this murky territory of Marvel arbitrarily just kind of changing things, Cubic and the Shaper of Worlds are able to overpower the Beyonder. Traditionally, it's not that way. The level of power he was shown to have in the in Secret Wars 2, and to a degree in the first Secret Wars, no way would, would Cubic and the Shaper of Worlds be able to overpower this guy. But such as it is, they were able to do that, right? And the reason why will actually become apparent here in a little bit. But at the end of it all, as they attack, what ends up happening is the Molecule Man Owen Reese is brought to the entire location by Volcana, basically his girl. The portal's open and the two of them are brought here because the Molecule Man starts to realize what's going on, right? He kind of pieced the piece everything together on his own off panel, but he realized Dr. Doom going after the Beyonder and asking the Beyonder to quote unquote make him whole would give Dr. Doom the intelligence he needs to seize control of the Beyonder's power and be able to maintain the Beyonder's power. And so that's when you have the Shaper of Worlds, Cubic, the Molecule Man, and all of them basically attacking uh, the Beyonder. Now in the midst of all that, Volcana is killed, but again, this is the level of the Molecule Man where he basically just restores her to life and then places them inside a protective dome where nothing can harm them, right? They're literally just there watching this massive conflict unfold. But at the end of the day, where the Beyonder is more or less subdued, even if only momentarily, it allows the story to start moving into exposition. It allows us to focus on what's actually taking place here. And so one of the things that we learn, or at least as it's explained, of course, once the revelation comes out about Dr. Doom's intention and so on and so forth, Ben Grimm steps up and says, look, the only reason why we're here is because we're trying to understand what's going on with the Beyonders. What are they? Why are they doing what they do? What's going on here? How does the new Wally and Earth Savage Land, right? Basically a kind of jungle environment that houses dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff that was created by, or at least engineered by the new Wally. What does all of this have to do? How does it all tie together? And do we need to be worried about the Beyonders returning? And so what the Shaper of Worlds says is somewhere in the negative zone, the mad conjunction of realms around us is a lightless universe. They dwell there. No one has ever seen them and no one ever will but they see all of us and they wish us well. They want us to grow, to become as they are. Now, as anybody knows from reading Jonathan Hickman's uh, Avengers and New Avengers going into Secret Wars, this is actually not the case, that the Beyonders wanted to wipe out the multiverse. <laughs> they were the exact opposite of the explanation that the Shaper of Worlds gets here. Uh, now, the question that you'd probably be asking yourself is, okay, like, did something change? Did their motivations change? The reality is that this explanation of the intentions and the motivations of the Beyonders was simply just changed by Jonathan Hickman to fit the story that he was telling. That's all it was, right? But the Shaper of Worlds says, you understand it is not accurate to describe the Beyonders as beings who do things in a chronological order. They transcend all such labels. Simply let us say as convenience that at some distant time, they became aware of the universe containing the earth. They could never enter the universe or any universe outside of their own. They are so beyond us that they must operate entirely through agents. Now, many of us in this universe have learned that Earth has a special combination of equalities which breeds super beings. Though many of us have sought to learn why, the answer remains unknown to us. But in our distant past, the Beyonders determined to find out. Now, one of the things to understand here is that at the time this story was written, 
a lot of the work regarding the Celestials modifying the genes of humanity, that had largely been done, but one of the things that was going on is there was a lot of bickering behind the scenes in Marvel as far as like the work Jack Kirby was doing. Jack Kirby by this point in time had basically, well, he was essentially gone, but when he crafted the Eternals and said the Eternals had modified the genes of early man, that's basically what led to people having powers and so on and so forth, that it really just existed to explain the Eternals and the Deviants. It hadn't been co-opted yet to explain why superheroes have powers. Now, during Grant Morrison's run, when he was specifically covering new X-Men and the weapons programs, as well as some of the stories that came before it, that's when Marvel started invoking the idea of the Celestials modifying the genes of baseline humans so that at some future point in time, they would develop powers. The easiest explanation is that would lead to mutants, but it was also used as an unofficial explanation for why Steve Rogers could receive the super soldier serum and instead of like dying due to the serum's effects, could be blasted with different forms of of light rays and then become Captain America. But again, what he says here is that the Beyonders contacted the alien race called Nuwali through a radical cube and that the Beyonders offered them gold to create a game preserve on Earth. Many have asked why, but the answer is apparent. The game preserve stocked and restocked over millennia was a laboratory of evolution. It may be said that the Beyonders wanted to experiment. Eons later, they used their knowledge to evolve the Fortescuans to act as their agents by nature rather than for reward for gold. Given such parents, it's little wonder the Fortescuans seek to limit their contact with others or go mad so easily. But he says with their cometary flybys, meaning they flew by looking like comets, they have discovered much that was useful to the Beyonders concerning beings on different worlds. They showed the Beyonders that what drives all beings is desire for what they lack. And so this was significant in terms of how they really explain the form and function of the Beyonders because again, what they said is the Beyonders have a level of power that just, because they're so extreme, they're so beyond everything, they can't function or exist inside of our universe. Now it's a very throwaway kind of hand wavy explanation because you would think a being or at least a group of beings with the power of God would be able to just enter in and out of universes as they saw fit. But for any number of reasons, they couldn't at this point in time. Time. Now, during Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, he corrected that. He was like, actually, they can. And when they came into the multiverse, they basically killed all the cosmic entities, including the Living Tribunal. It was really more Jonathan Hickman reworking this explanation to say the Beyonders don't see themselves as beings that need to come down to the level of individuals who exist in a normal universe, right? They're beyond that insofar as we're way more powerful than that. Why would we waste our time on that kind of thing, right? We've got bigger fish to fry and more important things to focus on. And so in response to that, the Beyonders contacted the Nuwali and said, you will be the ones that will travel around the universe and basically create life on different worlds. And so this was an explanation for why life exists on different planets across the cosmos. Does it fly in direct contradiction with the nature of the Celestials? Yes, but this is one of those instances when Marvel just didn't really offer any way to correct that. At the time this story was written, the idea was that if the new Wally were gonna be traveling around and creating life, they didn't have time to like monitor it. And so what they did is they had the Fortescuans created so that the Fortescuans could basically fly by different worlds and monitor those worlds and report back to the Nuwali, who in turn would report their findings to the Beyonders, and that the Beyonders themselves would basically just kind of monitor their experiments on Earth and just see how they could help the evolution of different races because they wanted those races to become as capable as the Beyonders themselves. Again, the Beyonders were approaching this from a place of positivity, right? From a place of trying to help groups better themselves as opposed to what Jonathan Hickman did, which was basically blow up the multiverse. And so what this does is it goes into an explanation about the nature of the cosmic cubes, specifically about the shaper of worlds and about Kavik, because what they what the shaper says is the Beyonders now moved to a third phase in their inter uh, in their action or interactions with us. They gave us the cosmic cube. And so what happened is the Beyonders basically modified seemingly reality in such a way so that every 34 year or 32 years and four months, a rift would open that would grant a person access to the power of the Beyondverse, where the Beyonders reside. And that if a person was present when that rift opened, they could literally draw that power out and it would shape itself into the form of a cube or it would go into a stasis cube that had been previously constructed. And that would become 
the Cosmic Cube. It's the explanation of why Cosmic Cubes are so powerful, because they literally contain the power of the Beyonders, which can basically do anything. And so what this meant is that, or at least when it comes to the Shaper of Worlds, these are two instances when the power of the Beyonders have been captured in the form of a Cosmic Cube, but they basically became sentient. They, they essentially evolved beyond simply just being a cube housing power and developed its own mind. So think of it like Skynet from Terminator, right? Except from, instead of wiping everything out, they just kind of flew off into the sunset and did their own thing. And that's basically it. But it's why these two are also so immensely powerful, because what they do is they explain the nature of the Beyonder itself. And even Molecule Man, once he starts to realize what's going on using his multiversal awareness, he offers his own explanation. And so what he says is that when it comes to the Beyonder, the Beyonder simply came into existence because when the Molecule Man was initially conducting his experiment or doing his work that led to him granting his power, being given his powers in the first place, that what he had inadvertently done was rip a hole in reality to the Beyondverse, that it wasn't created by the Beyonders and it wasn't supposed to happen. But in doing so, half of that power went into Owen Reese because there was no cosmic cube for that power to go into, and the other half of that power went out into the cosmos and became sentient. So the Beyonder is not actually a member of the race of Beyonders. Instead, the Beyonder is the power of the Beyonders which became sentient. So that's why he stands alone. That's why there's such a huge difference between the Beyonders and the Beyonder. And so as this explanation comes to bear, it's Marvel telling us that what's going on here is Molecule, Re uh, Molecule Man Owen Reese and the Beyonder are two sides of the same coin. But the Beyonder is actually more powerful than the Molecule Man. That's how it is that the Beyonder was actually able to overpower the Molecule Man during Secret Wars 2. It's just, sure, they share a similar source of power, but 40% of all that power that came out of the Beyondverse, 40% went into Molecule Man, 60% became the Beyonder, right? If you had to assign ratios in order to make it make sense. And so what this does is it explains why the Beyonder has never actually fulfilled a purpose. That the Beyonder, when it, when it initially emerged in like Secret Wars 1 and during Secret Wars 2, it simply just desired, right? That's all it was. Like, I desire. I desire to know things, right? I just desire stuff but nobody really knew what it actually desired. And the reason why is because it wasn't fulfilling its purpose. The role of the Beyonder was to fulfill the purpose of other people, right? It's designed to grant other people's wishes, to make other people's dreams come true. Not its own. That's not the role that it's supposed to play. And so in failing to fulfill that purpose by just going out and doing its own thing, it never truly felt satisfied. And when, when this whole explanation is given to the Beyonder, partly by Cubic or by Cubic in The Shaper of Worlds, as well as by the Molecule Man Owen Reese, that's when it starts to realize, okay, then the only way for our purpose to actually be fulfilled is for myself and Owen Reese to merge, right? To become whole, to become what we should have been when the initial experiment by Molecule Man took place that granted both of us our powers in the first place, that created me and granted the Molecule Man his abilities. And so what they end up doing is basically merging into a singular cosmic cube. And that in time, that cosmic cube stands a high likelihood of becoming sentient. Now, before it does, Dr. Doom does what Dr. Doom does, which is basically try to seize control of the cosmic cube. Of course, he's defeated right off the bat by, by Kovic and, and the uh, and the Shaper of Worlds. And that's basically the end of him. But it is a cool thing, right? It is a cool moment where Dr. Doom tries to like become God again, because that's what Dr. Doom always does. But at the end of the day, once the cube is created and the Molecule Man and the Beyonder essentially cease to exist, they just exist in this cube form. Everybody's whisked back to Four Freedoms Plaza, and then Dr. Doom, who is in effect basically made whole to a degree, goes back to his land to try to take back control of Latveria from his son, Christoph Renard, and that's it, right? That's basically how it ends. Now, in the future, Molecule Man would actually end up coming back, but he wouldn't be as powerful as he was before, right? This was a story, whenever you hear people talk about how there is a pre-retcon Molecule Man and post-retcon Molecule Man, meaning he was more powerful before than he is now, this is the moment when that happened. This is when they reduced the power of the Molecule Man Owen Reese and the story they used to do it. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.